cross homes <laughs> be a sign that we are here for you right here for you come on we are here for you let your breath blow let your breath come from heaven oh fill our hearts with your life we are here for you we are here for you time to get back on the altar to you our hearts are open oh nothing here is hidden oh you are our one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy oh god let your fire fall down come up oh let us shout let it be your anthem oh you're enough blaze across the sky lord we are here for you oh we are here for you come on let your word move oh let your word let it move in power Oh, let what's dead come to life. Lord, we are here for you. Lord, we are here for you. Come on. Sing it till you mean it. To you, our hearts. To you, our hearts are open. Oh, nothing here is hidden. Oh, you are our one for you alone are holy only you are worthy oh god come on to you our hearts sing it again oh to you our hearts are open oh nothing here is hidden oh you are our one desire for you alone are holy only you are worthy oh god let your fire fall down oh we welcome you with praise oh we welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh, we welcome in this place god we welcome you with praise oh we welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh, we welcome in this place yes almighty oh, we blow oh fan into flame we welcome you oh we welcome you with praise oh we welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh we welcome in this place god we welcome you with praise god we welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh, we welcome in this place yes don't fan into flame yes oh ignite your people ignite your people oh fan fan into flame fan into flame lord welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh, we welcome in this place god we welcome you with praise god we welcome you with praise oh almighty god of love oh, we welcome in this place yes Let your fire fall, let your wind blow. Oh, let your fire fall. Oh, let your wind blow in this place. Oh, in this place. Oh, in this place. 
Oh, let your fire fall. Oh, let your wind blow in this place. Oh, in this place, in this place, in this place. Oh, let your fire fall. Oh, let your wind come blow in this place. Oh, we long for you. We long for fresh wind. Oh, fresh wind from heaven, reigniting. Oh, we fed into flame. Oh, we fed into flame. Yes, Lord. Oh, let our hearts adore. Come, let our souls awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Oh, let your fire fall. Set our souls, set our souls to place. Almighty God of love, be welcome in. Let your fire, oh, let your fire fall. Set our souls, come set our souls to place. Almighty God of love, you're welcome in this place.
when you fill the room. Come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart bound. When you fill the room, come and rest on us.
Make you keep singing that.
So as we were singing that, like literally, he's hearing the cries of our hearts. And I saw this broom, this huge broom, just sweeping the path, like just preparing the path before you. And all we have to do is just worship him and surrender. And he, he is the one that makes our paths straight. I feel like there's toiling and striving that has to cease. Your strength will be found in quietness and trust and in worshiping him and in hungering and thirst after him. As we're singing this, he's literally just making the path straight. In the soil now surrender, you are breaking new ground in the crushing. So set a fire down that I can't contain. Oh, I want more of you, God. No matter what it takes. Come on. More of you, God. Come on. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more. No matter what it takes. Come on. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Oh, 
I want more of you, God. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, oh, that I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you, God. Set a fire. Oh, set a fire deep in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you. Set a fire. Oh, set a fire down. Come on. That I can't control. I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you, God. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Come on, fire fall down. Fire fall down. We're finding fire. Fire fall down on oh, fire fall down on us we pray all oh, consuming fire fire fall down on oh, fire fall down on us we pray yes. show us your heart show us your heart show us your way show me glory show me your glory show us your heart oh show me your heart show me your way show me your glory as i sing as i worship he's clearing the path fire fall down on oh, fire
part of our soul every part of our soul we surrender that it hidden parts we don't want anybody else to know about we give it to you tonight God we lay down every offense and everything no hindrance we lay aside all the weight of God. feel like I'm just going to kind of share my heart in this. We've been talking for several weeks about things that bring transformation to us as individuals and things that bring transformation to the world and to regions and to families. We've talked about the idea that one of the key things of, tra of living a transformative life is, is refusing to believe anything other than the truth that God speaks. That's essential. Um, living a transformative life requires us to plant ourselves next to the streams of living water. You know, we oftentimes plant ourselves next to things that bring death, not life. Last week we talked about this idea that to think, to be transformative and to live a transformative life, we have to position ourselves and to think generationally. Not just to think generationally within our own family, but that we are to be giving inheritances in the spirit. And that we are to function as fathers and mothers. But before we can fo function as fathers and mothers in the Lord, we have to learn to function as sons and daughters. And... Um, if we begin to think generationally, we will, we will begin to see not just our own lives shift, but the lives of all those that come behind us. 
You know, it's interesting because this week I, I received a phone call from Brandon Brecht, who was here for many years, and, and he left and, and moved to Pennsylvania, and he's in the Global School of Supernatural Ministry. And he, um, and, you know, I poured a lot of time into this young man, and he's an he's a honorable son in the Lord. And, I, and it was interesting because I said to him, I said, Brandon, how's it going? What, 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 what are you struggling with? Are you, you know, like a, like a father, are you, are you okay? Do you need any money? How are you doing? What do you need? And he's good. And I said, well, where, where are you experiencing success? And he was sharing with me different things. And where are you experiencing struggles? And his struggles are not the things that you would expect. His struggles were things like this. It's hard right now because everything we've, we're being taught, with the exception of a few things, you've already taught us. And he says, the thing I'm learning is to be patient and to receive even when I've already learned the main portions of this. And so it's been so, such a great thing to teach him humility and all these things. And, and that's what happens when you think generationally, those that the Lord has put in your, in your life, you, you're able to set them up that when they set, step into the next season, not only are they prepared, but they're over-prepared. Right? That's what we do when we think generationally. We don't just send somebody in to where they're either going to sink or swim. We're going to send them in to where they're, where they're not only are they thriving, but they're going to pull those who are sinking up to the top. And so tonight, as we begin to look at this idea of transformation and living transformative lives, um, it really, the whole idea is, if we want to experience transformation in our lives, and we want to see transformation in the world that we live in, and you know, that world that we live in is, is like an onion. You know, where we're at the core of it, and there's different layers the further we go out. And the, and the amount of influence we have that from the further we go out changes. But we have a world that we live in, and so we want to see it transformed where we're at, but each layer away from us, we want to see transformation in that all the way to the ends of the earth. Is that, is that not how we should be thinking as believers in Christ? I not only want to see a transformation within my own soul, I want the transformation that takes place in my soul to bring transformation throughout all the earth to the ends of it. And so I'm convinced that in order for us to start to walk in that and for us to begin to experience that and for us to be able to release this, what we have to understand is there's this place where we desire more than anything, and I mean more than anything, to encounter him. If our desires are for anything more than to encounter the Father, we're not going to experience the transformation that is going to lead to internal transformation and then eventually global transformation. It's just not going to happen. And so we have to take this position, we have to take this this, this place where we say above all all I want to do is encounter him see the thing is is there's this there's this thing that happens in the church and if you've grown up in the church or you've spent any time in it, it it's like this give your life to Jesus the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus right Romans 6 23 and then as soon as you get the free gift of God you need to learn to work to keep it. That's not true. It's not biblical. It's not real. But it is a reality within the church because we have this idea that says, once I have enough of an encounter with Jesus in order to have my soul saved from an eternal damnation, I have to work like crazy to stay in good graces with him. And that's not true. The reality is this. The reality is this, is that the Lord is calling us from one encounter to another encounter to another encounter. And as we continue to encounter him and who he is and his glory in, in the world that we live in and his glory in our lives, what will happen is the world that we encounter will experience his glory as they encounter us. 
You follow me? And so we have to come to this place, you know, more and more I read the Bible. I, you know, I love, I, love, I love the gospel. I love the, the story of Jesus. How can you not? I love it. Um, there's a guy out of um, Dallas, Texas. Oh, Lord, I forgot his name. He wrote the book, Can You Not Tarry for an Hour? What's his name? Uh, it's not Ronnie Floyd. He wrote The Power of Prayer and Fasting. It's, uh, bah, 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 bah. it doesn't matter. But he said, read the red and pray for power. Yeah. Right? That's the Gospels. Read the red, pray for power. I think he pastored the Rock Church in Dallas. I'm, I'm lost now. I've already, I'm thinking about that. Larry Lee, that's who, exactly who it is. Thank you. Thank you. Read the red and pray for power. And, and I love the epistles, you know, like the letters that Paul writes to the church and Peter's written to the church and, 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 and John wrote I, I, in the book of Acts that Luke wrote. Let me just tell you something also. When you read the book of Acts, I would encourage you to not read it independent of Luke. Always read them together, like as if they're one book, Luke and Acts, Luke Acts. But I have lately just been in love with the Old Testament, especially the prophets. And, um, and reading through Psalms, because you know, the Old Testament, a lot of times people today in 21st century America feel as though that is an old covenant. Well, you know the gospel is the gospel, and it was throughout the entire scripture. The good news of God redeeming humanity. And the Old Testament is a perfect way for us to apply what we need in our lives. Because these people would stand before the Lord and just cry their heart out. They made all the mistakes we make. The New Testament is mostly filled outside the Gospels. The writings of the, of the apostles, their letters, are like instructions. They're instructions on how to deal with Old Testament behavior. And Old Testament behavior is the behavior that we exhibit. Right? It's, the Old Testament is that picture of life outside of Christ. Where we're in and we're out. And we're in and we're out. Cycles of sin and repentance. But I just, find, I just find when I read the Old Testament, I'm reading my thoughts. I'm reading my attitudes. And, and as we consider this idea that if we're going to live a life that's transformative and that we're going to see transformation come in the world that we live in, not just within ourselves, but a, a, a transformative work that's going to shape the nation that we live in and the world that we live in, we have to begin to desire encounter with him more than anything else and there's a million things that are pulling us drawing us out of this place of encounter and and listen listen encounter comes in many forms and it comes in many sizes and it comes in many manifestations oftentimes we think that this encounter is going to come in such a way where you're going to be completely uh, lambasted by the Holy Spirit and a mess and a puddle of snot and tears on the floor and, and whatever else. Sometimes it comes just in that moment where, where the Lord speaks something to you and the peace that you've desperately been searching for is released into your heart. And sometimes it's the other. And sometimes it's somewhere in between. But the reality is if we do not desire encounter with God, we will not experience the transformation that we say that we want. And the thing about it is, is God sets a table for his people to sit and eat what he has for them, but we have to make the choice to sit down, put the fork in our hand, and dine. This is why David says in Psalm 34, this is why David says in Psalm 34, he says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
And I love this, and here's why I love it. Uh, because in Psalm 34, when he says, taste and see, look at what he does. He says that you must encounter him by ingesting him before you can see that he is good. See, this is what we do. We want to sit back and we want to put God on trial and say, God, prove to me that you were good so that I can see it. And he says, no, 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 I'm not going to play your game. No, no, no. You're going to taste me first. And when you encounter me through taking me into your being, what's going to happen is you're going to see my goodness. And when we begin to experience His goodness, what's going to happen is we're going to experience the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then David goes on to write in verse 9, he says, Fear the Lord, you His holy people, for those who fear Him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So think about this. Think about this. We're, when we have areas in our lives where we're experiencing lack, it's an invitation for encounter. When we have areas in our heart where we are experiencing lack, it's an invitation to encounter Him, to taste and see that He is good. When we have areas, listen, this, this is, to encounter God goes through all areas of life. When you have areas in your health that are in lack, this is when you go and you taste and see that the Lord is good, that you begin to pursue Him, that you begin to seek Him, because those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. When you have areas in your finances that are in lack, what do you do? You have to say, Lord, I, I have, I'm in lack. So I have to seek you in my finances, and sometimes that's coming into obedience when you're walking in disobedience. But when we, if we want to truly experience lives of transformation, what we have to understand is it comes through encounter, and when we have encounter, we release encounter. I actually think that's pretty good preaching. And so, so we have to get to this place where we desire Him. We want Him. We desire His goodness. We desire to encounter Him in the big and in the little. Listen, it's time that we come to this place where the things that are foolishness are put aside. And before all things, we desire encounter. We desire encounter. I think that's the only thing when we, when, you know, we were, share, we were speaking earlier as people were sharing testimonies. Listen, the enemy is very active, very active releasing encounter with him throughout the world. The enemy of your soul is very active releasing activity or an encounter that people are engaging in. Look at the filth that Hollywood produces. Look at the filth in our educational system. I mean, just consider, just consider, thank God in the state of Florida that we have a governor that has courage where they passed a law that they can't teach children under third, third grade and under uh, uh, transgenderism and sexuality. Thank God that this man has courage because the enemy is knocking on the door of your house and he's saying, encounter me. But we are the ones that carry the very encounter of God into the world. But are we to this place where, where we hunger for him more than anything? You know, David in, in Psalm 84, he says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. 
My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sink, sink for joy to the living God. He's saying, I'm literally fainting to be in the place in which you dwell. Now imagine this for a moment. Imagine this. David is talking about a place. David is talking about a place where the, where the Lord dwelled in the temple. But when Jesus died and the veil that separated man from the presence of God was ripped from the top to the bottom, that place is in us. But are we aware of it? Imagine this for a moment, and uh, it says in Revelations, in, or yeah, I think, in my house there are many mansions. Do you, know, do you know that those mansions are not buildings? In my, in my house, there are many mansions. The Lord is talking about you and me. We're the dwelling place. And so how can, how can we, if we are believers in Jesus and we are the dwelling place of God, how can we go throughout our life without encountering Him in such a way that we're experiencing transformation and then transforming the world? There's only one reason we don't want to. It's the only re reasonable explanation that I can consider. Because if the very dwelling place of God is inside of us, and, and He is here, and all we have to do to encounter Him is make ourselves available to His presence that's within us, if, and, and be transformed by His presence that's within us, the only reason we're not experiencing that transformation is because we don't want to. Because we have to consider, like David said in Psalm 42, he says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living water. Are we thirsty for him? The, think about this. David is talking about a water that comes externally from the presence of God, but yet he's put, and put in our bellies streams of living water. We don't even have to go looking for it. He's put it inside of us, but the only reason we're not drinking it is because we're drinking from other fountains. And when we experience this transformative encounter with God, you understand that the world will be changed. The world will be changed. Because if you're living a transformed life, you will bring transform, transformation with you. Look, think about the testimony of a guy who was halfway through a drug program, encounters a guy with a brain tumor. He doesn't even know really how to pray for him, and he only did what he knew to do. And a year and a half, maybe two years later, he finds out that a week later the guy was cleared of a brain tumor. The family thinking he's going to die, the family's thinking he's going to die, but he's not dying. He's better than he was before. And that's transformation, because the springs of living water are coming out. And this is the life we're to live, because if, but the problem is, is we cannot release transformation through encounter if we don't have transformation through encounter. And, you know, the, the problem is, the problem is, is oftentimes we know that the gospel is good news, but we don't share it, and we don't preach it, and we don't release it because we're concerned about how other people will respond to us. They'll reject us. There's a young man that I know, um, I'm hoping to have him come and minister sometime, maybe next year, I don't know. His name is Brian Starley. And um, he has a very strong prophetic voice, um, and he, um, he, uh, 
he uh, is an incredible student of revival history. And um, his wife, Camden, is an amazing young woman. And I was talking with Brian last summer. Um, we were in Puerto Rico, and he was telling me a story about a guy who used to do big crusades. And they would fund these big crusades, and I'm talking 100 years ago. And it was Camden's grandfather. He used to promote them, and he used to uh, fund them. And they did this big crusade. I forget what city it was in. So I think somewhere like in North Carolina or somewhere like that. And all thousands of people came. And in all of this crusade, only one person came to receive Christ. Only one person. It's heartbreaking. Because you think about the, all the time, all the money, all the resources, all the, all the blood, sweat, and tears that go into that. And one person can't, gave their life to Christ. And now, don't get me wrong. We celebrate the fact that one did, right? Is it, what's it worth? But when you find out that the man that got saved, his name was Billy Graham. What does it matter? Because we don't know what happens when we make space for one person to encounter God. How they can make space when they, when they encounter God and bring other people into that encounter. You understand what I mean? And so... This wasn't part of my message, but I feel like I needed to read it. So there's this, because the thing is, is we don't, we don't want to be rejected for the gospel. Well, you're going to be rejected for the gospel. You're going to be rejected for the gospel. And you're not going to be, uh, people are not going to be grateful. Because they're not sure that the good news is good news for them, because the good news for them may require them to shift. And so Jesus here in Luke 17, it says, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along beside Samaria in Galilee, and he entered a village, and he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And he lifted up his voice, and they lifted up their voice, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, um, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and, and they, they went, and they were cleansed. Then one of them saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. Now he was a Samaritan. And Jesus says, we're not ten clean. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for the, this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And the Lord, the Lord is saying through this, will we minister to the ten? Will we bring encounter to the ten even if only one returns? Will we? Will we allow the nine to go off and do whatever they want to do but still introduce encounter to them regardless of how they respond? Will we do that? Because the reality is, the reality is, the majority of people, especially in America, they don't need faith to live. They think they only need Facebook. You don't need faith to live in America. Sometimes you need faith just to go to Walmart. I don't go there. I think I've been there once in five years. And so immediately after this happened, being asked by the Pharisees in verse 20, what, when the kingdom of God would come. So the Pharisees are saying, you know, they just, they just seen Jesus minister to these lepers and one of them come and, and, and it wasn't a, a Jew, it was a Samaritan. And I love how Jesus touches Samaritans 
And the Pharisees say, they are basically asking, when are we going to see the kingdom of God? And, and this, is what they're, this is what they're asking. We have to understand what they're asking. They're asking the question, when are we going to see the Roman Empire thrown out of Israel? That's what they're asking. They're not concerned about the kingdom of heaven. They're concerned about their political space in Israel. And he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, it is here. See, they were waiting for a king to ride in on a white horse with a, with a sword moving the Romans out of Israel. Then little did they know that Jesus, whenever he came in on his triumphal entry, would be coming in on a donkey. For they will not say, look, here it is, or there, behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. See, the kingdom lives in you. And when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and when we taste and see that he is good, and when we, when we long for his presence like a deer who is thirsty, looking for streams of living water, nothing else will satisfy. But I'm convinced that we have to have an encounter in order to truly position ourselves in the place of royalty that we're called to live. You understand that if you're in Jesus, you are not a pauper. You are a prince. You are you and a princess. You, you carry the royalty of the kingdom of heaven with you. You are not a beggar. And if, you're in, if you are a child of God and you are begging, you do not know where you stand. You might have had to beg in your home for the things that you thought you needed when you were a child, but in the kingdom, he is a good father, and he does not give his children stones when they ask for bread. He is a good father. He does not give his children the silent treatment when they want to speak with him. Right? And so this encounter, when we experience this encounter, what we have to realize is that encounter is not to be held for yourself, but it is to be given away. It is to be given away, you know, and, 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 and when you begin to release the kingdom of heaven, it is not going to look like what people think it will look like. It will look like when Clarice Mittler went to Brazil and we prayed for her and I said, the first person you pray for, they are going to receive their sight. And would you know, the first blind person she encountered was blind until she prayed. She'd never prayed for anybody in her whole life. And their sight was restored. Blind eyes opened. It's amazing. That's the gospel. And you know what? We don't know if that person's pursuing the Lord or not. I've prayed, listen, I've prayed for hundreds of people. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have received healing when I've prayed for them. And you know, like, you know what? They're like the one. The one came back. That's not my problem. That's not my problem, and it's not your problem. You know, not that long ago, Pastor Rick received a phone call about a, a lady that would died, and they asked to pray. He didn't even know the lady. They prayed over the phone, and the lady came back to life. We hear brain tumors. We hear just tonight a brain tumor prayed for two and a half years ago, and we get the report today that, he's, that the man is made alive. That's what happens when one that has an encounter releases an encounter into the world that we live in. People need to stop being argued into the kingdom and they need to experience the kingdom because if I can argue you in, somebody else can argue you out. But the reality is is that if you have an area of lack, that's an area where you need to seek him. If you, 
you have no peace, if you have no peace, you need to seek him because he's the prince of peace. I don't know, that's just something that just hit me there. There's, there's this thing where um, I feel like there's some here tonight that desperately are, they don't even realize they need peace because you're living your life in such a state of mental chaos. And, and, this, and what I'm seeing is, you know, that, that variety show act of the guy that's spinning plates on all these sticks. And the Lord is basically saying, let the sticks, let the plates fall. All of that's false significance anyway. Let them fall. And so, the Lord is, the Lord is calling us into this place of encounter so that we can be transformed. And so that we can release transformation in the world. If you're not experiencing transformation, it's because there's an area in which you need to seek him. And so, you know, one of the greatest examples of this encounter thing, we're all called into this place of, of royalty. You're called into royalty. The son and a daughter of the king you're called into royalty and kings and queens when they enter into the place that the kingdom in which they operate their very presence demands shift their very presence will demand that things will shift and and Kings and queens, when they live their lives, they don't just live their lives based on good kings and queens. They don't just live their lives based on what pleases them, but what pleases the kingdom and what's good for everybody in the kingdom and how, and how it benefits the kingdom and all of the generations that follow them. And so, you know, there's this very interesting encounter in 1 Samuel chapter 16 where, where Samuel goes to Jesse's home. He goes to Jesse's home, and Jesse lines up all of his sons. He lines up all of his sons because Samuel the prophet is coming to anoint one of them the next king of Israel. And after he looks at them all, he says, well, the one I came to anoint is not here. And he says, do you have another son? And he says, yeah, he's out watching the sheep. And the word that they used to describe, that Jesse used to describe David, is the Hebrew word, the hakatan. I love that word. It's just fun to say. That's maybe one of my favorite Hebrew words, hakatan. My favorite Greek word is polypoyokalos. My Spanish word is sofrito. Arroz con queso. Frijoles negro. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Hakatan. Jesse says, yeah, the Hakatan is out watching the sheep. And the Hakatan basically means the lowest of the low. The throwaway. The throwaway. Yeah, that little son, that little son, that little throwaway son, he's out watching the sheep. But one of these must have been a better choice for king. Look how tall and handsome and big they are. And all of a sudden, this little guy comes in, and, and, and Saul says, there he is. And he pours the oil on him to anoint him king. And the phrase that is used it says, you have it? You have it for me? Verse 13. Look at what it says. And the Spirit of the Lord. Do you not have it? Samuel 16, 13 for Samuel. Bam. Anyway. 
It says, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. So he's the Hakaton, the throwaway kid, the one that did not have his father's heart. He's out just taking care of his father's business. And whenever God says, it's time for you to understand who you are, the Spirit of God rushes upon him. What does that look like? That looks like encounter. And because of that one encounter, listen, what you need to understand is immediately following that encounter, the years to come, David went through significant torment. Just because you have an encounter with God, that doesn't mean that the streets that you're going to walk in are going to be the yellow brick road. Sometimes it's going to be the place of thorns and, and twists and turns. But what happened was he was already named king, and he had to walk through that season of being developed into a king. And the nation of Israel benefited because of it. He was imperfect. But one encounter can shift an entire nation. It went from, it went from the nation of Saul to the nation of the little Hakaton who had an encounter with God and turned an entire nation to the Lord. The little Hakaton. It's just fun to say. And so if you'll stand up. Close your eyes. I want you to just set your affection upon the Lord. Just begin to think about it. Just think about the Lord. just a moment I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask him to begin to rush around this room Some of us need an encounter. But this encounter is not just for you. The Lord is not calling you to be one of the nine that walked away, but one of the one who came back and showed his faithfulness to the one who touched him. So put your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive a gift. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to invite Holy Spirit to come and rush. And I want you to pay attention to your body. I want you to pay attention while we're praying. Spirit come come now come now we want to encounter with you the type of encounter that transforms us and renews us so that we can be the salt and the light in the world the salt that enhances the world Lord, 
Lord, I pray, Father, for an encounter with the leaven of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that's been mixed into a, to a lump of dough. Once leaven gets put into the dough, it can never be separated. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. If you're experiencing a shift in your body, whether you're getting hot or like cold or you feel the weight or peace, um, electricity, in your hands. Um, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. If your chest is pumping, you have that, your heart's just beating like crazy. That's the Lord. He, you are having an encounter with the Lord, but he, in the kingdom there is always more. And he says that I'm not wanting to just give you a tingly so that you can have a tingly. I'm wanting you to. I'm wanting you to know that I'm present and that you are. You are on. You are on my mind is what the Lord is saying. And you are on my mind because there are areas in which I want you to pursue after me. That I want you to hunger and thirst for me. That I want you to taste and see that I am good. That that I want you to have this thing like a deer panting after the water because. What, is, what you've experienced is enough, is not enough. That he's calling you into the deeper places. That he's calling you into the places of deeper surrender so that you can have deeper breakthrough. And as you experience deeper breakthrough, your impact on your world is going to be blown wide open. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Jesus is saying that you have ran for years and years and tried to do it on your own. But I'm right here. And he's saying, give your life to me. Give your life to me. And so if you're experiencing any of the things I mentioned, any sort of shift in your body, I want to specifically pray for you because that's where the Lord is moving. He is touching. Um, it's not that I want to neglect the other, but this is, this is him moving. So I just want to simply bless what he's blessing. But I also want this, that if you have not given your life to Jesus, and you say that I know without Jesus that I am separated from God and I need to give my life to him and I need to pursue him and I need him to set me free from my sin and my shame and I, and I, and I need to be united with God, know that I want to pray with you too. We want to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. And so if you're experiencing a shift and, and, and we just want to bless what he's blessing Go ahead and just begin to move out of your seat and come up here. And we're only going to take a minute. I'm not going to take a lot of time for this. And come now.